<laughs> Creative glassology. <laughs> I like that. I should put that on my business cards. That's a missed opportunity right there, I'll tell you what. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, non-binary folk of all ages, welcome to Vancouver, BC. Welcome to the Cypher Life show. Largely consists of crochet, swearing, and occasionally talking about vintage glass. <laughs> I may have to rename it as something to do with glassology. Although I don't know if there is actually official, an official name for the study of, like, glassware per se. Um, I think that would be a fun thing to get a degree in. Mostly because I think it would be really funny. Um, probably a Bachelor of Arts of some description. So in case anyone's wondering what we're actually doing today, crochet-wise, is undoubtedly something that's going to make me lose my mind. And this is definitely a technique that you will have never seen before. Because I don't know of anyone else who's dumb enough to try. Or stupid enough. Or, you know, who has the manual dexterity. But me, with my ability to do almost every crochet style under the fucking sun, I take it as a personal challenge to do, essentially, bizarre shit in crochet. Because, because why not? I decided to learn how to crochet backwards and upside down just because I saw a video and decided I like a challenge. Anyway, so this particular technique that we are doing, okay, you can see I'm holding, this is two, obviously two strand of color work. I'm holding one strand in each hand, okay? This is combining two different styles. It is essentially combining pen, like the right, like traditional style crochet, the pin grip with the left-handed throwing style so that I can work two strands effectively at the same time and then kind of split the difference in the stitches. So the way that I'm doing this is that for all of the doubles I'm doing the first two throws essentially. The loop there with the black, loop again with the black, and then the last throw is with the grey and that produces this line across the top. Okay and believe me I've tried to work out a way to do this just using a single style and I've found it to be what I can only describe as a giant pain in the tits and cannot recommend. It just, it's immensely annoying because you have to try and hold and pick up two set, two pieces of yarn essentially in one hand. So I started doing color work like using essentially the, the double up of the styles like and using, you know, holding the one hand, one, like, you know, you did one yarn in each hand kind of a thing. And I found that it's certainly quicker and it certainly allows for like much, it allows for a lot of different, like you've got more options basically and it's less of a pain in the bollocks when you're trying to do this weird kind of split stitch kind of stuff where you're doing like half of a stitch wood colour. It's like, it's annoying. Hey dead chrome, how's it going? Have you got your streaming ring set up yet? <laughs> loop stitch, I know loop stitch, I've never actually tried to do it, doesn't appeal unfortunately. Like, I, I see a lot of, like, crochet stitches and they're just like, eh, they're, they're okay, they're fun, but I'm just like, eh, well. It's not just one colour. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, dear. Try to keep up. There's, there's this thing called colour work, okay? Colour work, by the way, is probably one of my least favourite things to do. Like, I just do not enjoy it. I like generally working in texture and I like working in a single colour. However, I got this idea for a bag and I thought, balls anyway it's going to mean that I'm going to need to I essentially needed to use two colors to kind of pull it off so I said well fuck it I guess I'm doing strand of color work yeah it just it's annoying it's like you know it is it is what it is like I've been having a real pain in the box with like just yarn lately because a lot of the stuff that I'm picking up is just like I this is not working for crochet and I'm constantly just making bags so like why in the world am I even bothering with like just things like basic acrylic or whatever like that. Like so much yarn, it's like if I, sh if I can get on my high horse for a second, uh, as I frequently like to do, a lot of yarn is essentially made for people to knit. And I obviously do not knit, I crochet. And I think that crochet is not served very well by having yarns that were designed to be used to, you know, to, to knit with. Like they're, they're designed to essentially be turned into stockinette, you know? And that's like, okay, that's great. That's not going to work for like crochet, which has no real good analog for that. It's a stitch, all right. I'm currently crocheting an ambergris movie sloth with the loose. Suit. Oh my God. That sounds like hell. Um, good luck with it though. <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to be super cute. Like I just, ambergris I think are just 
oh, that's one of my community. I, I have a great respect for the people who have enough of the patience to to do amigurumi. Because although they're 3D and structural, I don't know why it is. I just find them so fiddly that they drive me crazy. It's like, I like doing, I like making bags. That's like about the level of like usability I want. It's like, I don't do so much like, oh, come on. I don't do so much kind of decor. Why aren't you coming out? I'm center pro Stay. Stay, dickhead. Talking to the urine again. All right. All you've left is three arms. Great, great. I hope you're. I hope you're enjoying the process. I know I definitely don't when it comes to amigurumi, but that's 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 like a personal thing. You know that is what it is. Uh, so I don't know if you guys know here in BC, it's been variously it's been raining and hot as balls. That has not changed. Unfortunately, I was not on stream last week due to various factors. Um, it was a bit of a family emergency. Is what it is. Oh wait, hold on. There we go. Why are you? Yeah, no, hold on. There we go. You know someone's serious when you call a ball of yarn dickhead. I talk to my yarn all the time. Literally all the time. You know? And I have this very weird tendency to anthropomorphize my yarn, which I refuse to apologize for because everyone needs to have, you know, their their methods of controlling mental illness, and that has happened to be mine. Yeah. These These two, by the way, these are not the same type of yarn. This is a little bit more genial than this one. This one's argumentative. Just saying. Okay. Between the two of them, I much prefer working with this. And I know everybody gives us shit about like, oh, you know, working with black yarn or whatever. I don't think I've ever had an issue working with black yarn. Like, I don't know what it is. I just seem to, like, I, I don't think I've ever had a problem. Like, I don't find it that, that tricky. But this stuff, this stuff does not, is not on board like yet and I've been working like half a bag for them at this rate <sighs> like it's it's usable but I would say that like it was a bit of touch and go there for a while and I'm definitely not happy like with the with the output if you know what I mean like because here's the thing all right I've been pissing about this is the pattern that gets produced okay this kind of like arrow pattern on the front okay and I don't know whether I was going for this shit. I was just like, I had this weird idea of something that's going to look kind of cool as if I do my, uh, like my usual fan pattern, except added essentially a variation where the tops of all the double crochets are essentially handled using, using a different color. Okay. Using double strand color work. Yeah. Now here's the thing. The inside, if I pull this out for a second and turn this sucker inside out. The inside has a little bit more kind of interest going with it. Like it's got like, I, I, I will definitely need opinions, I believe, because I think this is a lot more, as it has a lot kind of, it's essentially it's a cooler look, you know, this kind of weird net kind of crosshatch. I don't know what the fuck you want to call it, all right? It's weird. It's cool. It's interesting. I kind of like it. I don't know if everyone else does. It's just like, I've already talked to Frank and he's just like, you're the fucking talent. Piss off. You know, he's here just in case anybody's wondering. I still haven't fired him. Not for lack of him poking me about it. Anyway, this all has to be worked from the front, so it's not neither here nor there. I'm going to continue in the way that I'm going, and then we shall see in what blasted hellscape we end up. And how have I turned this around on me? Come on. Ah, just, okay, just, all right, fine. Okay, there we go. There we go. Right. I mean, yes, technically this would be reversible. It's like, yeah, you could do that. You absolutely could do that. Also, my bags tend to be tend to roll that way anyway. But I, I, you know, I, you know, I don't know. Like, I'm still just kind of like, I'm still kind of like in two minds essentially about this pattern. Like, this uses a better version of my standard base. Hey, Crumber Scout, hello. Every bag is reversible if you're not an, if you're if you're not a coward. <laughs> oh, like the the octopus plushie. Yeah, that thing's cute. So this is the base, like you can see that it's like um, a thick, you know, quite fairly tight, wo tightly woven um, split stitch, split V or waistcoat stitch, whatever the fuck you want to call it, I don't know. It's got every possible name. Anyway, better version of this. I have been tooling around with this for a while. I think I finally nailed down like, like what I want that to be, essentially. Such that it doesn't like get weirdly shaped at the corners where I do the increases, because that was definitely a concern in the last few bags that I did. 
nice thing though is that the bag that I've been test driving as my own personal bag for a little bit I'm actually going to continue using that for a while because I am happy enough with the pattern that I think it's going to be a winner and I, l I really do like I like the the look of it I like the the like the it's kind of like my jam it's a shoulder bag and it's just what the fuck is that it's just been working out quite nicely why is there fluff on the yarn yeah it's been working out quite nicely the straps do stretch because of the specific yarn that I use, but I figure if I actually replace that with a a different kind of yarn that I've gone wrong, if I replace that with a different kind of yarn or with a cord that doesn't stretch, then I'm pretty sure that that will, that will solve that problem and I won't have an issue with the cord like handles stretching unduly because I'm not sure if everyone's going to be into that. Like I can create like a knitted eye cord of the right length, but I'll have to add the caveat that, okay, listen, if you are going to use this, chances are it is going to stretch quite a bit. So bear that in mind when you actually do make it. Um, I haven't measured exactly how much stretch is in it, but it's fairly significant over like, you know, general usage, I would think for like, it's, I've been using it like as my daily driver handbag now for I think a week or two. And it's definitely stretched more than I thought it was going to. So not a bad thing, you know, it just means that like the next one's going to have a slightly shorter handle I want to say but yeah stretches at least 20% like I mean I, I you know I wouldn't actually be I, I haven't estimated it yet I probably should you know but it's made with using a burnet um cotton and nylon yarn which does like it is like a really good corded like woven yarn like it's a ribbon yarn and it is like really good for bags I will say this much like I, I would nearly go to say like if I can get that stuff cheaply it will become my yarn of choice when I am making bags because I just like it's just that it's that comfy to use and to produce like and because I keep looking at the, like the stuff is fucking acrylic and I'm like oh, this stuff is not working out because like it just doesn't it doesn't mesh well I would say it fuzzes a bit too much and I do not like that and I like the strength of the nylon and the kind of finish of the cotton ribbon I think that's that that's that's still a kind of like a nice kind of like comfy range I think that we're going to go for like part of the reason I've been kind of a bit pissy with like looking at different yarn types and I just want to say this now right if anyone here is if anyone here is like a crafter okay and they want some free yarn I want you to send me a message okay because I'll send you some free yarn you okay oh yeah we're having technical problems apparently are you no okay <laughs> what oh okay nice go on Sorry, <laughs> kicking things now. No. Okay, so so here's the thing, right? If you are a crafter and if you want some free yarn, I will send you some very nice free yarn because as it happens, I have what I can only describe as a metric fuck ton of yarn and I'm not using any of it because a massive amount of it is, I swear to God, it is just made. Yes, free yarn. Send me a message and I will send you some free fucking yarn. Wolfman Midnight, I love your name. Hi, it's not midnight yet. I hope you're not a wolfman yet. If you are, however, good dog. Anyway, so yeah, I'll give away some free yarn to, and just basically tell me what you make or what kind of yarn you like and I'll go through my stash and see if I can dig out some stuff that's that you might like. You know, I'm just, I have so much of that stuff and I swear I'm not using any of it because all I'm making right now is bags. I swear to God, I make bags. I make absolute shit ton of yarn. I mean, if you're in the States, like, fuck it, I'll just ship it for free. Just like, as long as you're not like in the bum fuck nowhere. Yeah, I'll, you know, whatever. Give me a, go, I'm, I have Kofi. Send me, I don't know, send me 10 I don't, I have no idea. Just DM me, we'll sort something out, whatever. But yeah, no, I've got a, I've got a ton of really nice yarn. But the thing is that it's all really good yarn for knitting. Maybe not so much for the whole crochet thing. And it's definitely not good for the crochet, um, middle of bum fuck Tennessee. Hang on, I'm going to just, there we go. <laughs> Ricardito, do you actually knit or crochet? Or are you just here for the glass? Which, by the way, I can... <laughs> if someone does that, if actually someone does, does the redeem for um, show a vintage item, I got some good stuff, okay? Oh boy, have I had an eventful week. <laughs> Super eventful. You're here to vibe. Well, okay. Well, I mean, if you want to learn something about glass, I will also... I can also teach you some shit about glass. Because... Um, like I tell you, I tell you all lads, I've been having, and I just keep buggering up at the, oh, okay. All right, I'm gonna join this properly 
And then we're going to just, then we're going to show some vintage items. All right. Okay. I'll put that down for a sec. All right. Eh. All right, children. Tonight you're going to learn a thing about early American pattern glass. Oh, I'm going to show you some stuff. Okay. First thing I'm going to show you, all right, is this little thing. Okay. And I know it doesn't look like much. All right, because they never looks like much. All right, let's be clear. Never, ever, ever does it look like much. Glass, as well, as we know, is entirely unmarked most of the time. Sometimes it'll have a little embossed. It, yeah, segment about glass, of course. It's like the other thing, you know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm like officially an antique dealer, in who specializes in glass. And I spent, I swear to God, the entire week going around to various antique stores and going in and talking to them, going like, "Hey, would you like to, would you like to sell glass?" And most of the time they're saying, "Eh, no, not really." And I was like, "Okay, that's good. Can I buy your glass?" And at that point they were like, "Hmm, we should talk more." And that's been interesting. I'll tell you what. But okay, okay look. Anyway, anyway, all right. You're going to learn a few things about early American pattern glass, right? So essentially, in the 19th century, okay, when crystal kind of got to be more popular, especially cut crystal, right? There was an entire thing going on where, like, the American, like the the American industry for cut crystal kind of essentially exploded, okay? And that led to a thing that we call American Brilliant Cut or American Brilliant Period Crystal, right? Mid to late 19th century, okay? Great time. You got some amazing stuff out of it. I have bought and sold ABP. Uh, works. There's definitely a market. It, would, it used to be much stronger. It used to be huge in the 70s. It's not really as much anymore. People still do collect it though, you know. And this crystal is always incredibly heavy and it's incredibly bright. It's like, it's because they made the stuff using, using like lead uh, um, or like, there's a, there was a different way, a different composition. I think it was mostly lead, but like when you actually shine the UV torch on them, they have a very pale kind of fluorescence. Usually it's like kind of a lime green thing going on. Anyway, that's ABP, all right? Now, EAPG, Early American Pattern Glass, is essentially something rather different, okay? Early American Pattern Glass was effectively when the pattern, like, when when glassmakers kind of, like, they really kind of, get, like, kind of the whole industry kind of exploded, and especially in the late 19th century, they started working out how to do pressed glass, and that's essentially this stuff, okay? And this one, you can see it because... There is a seam, hopefully you can see it right here, that little line right there. That is the seam of the mold, okay? And this essentially gave them all kinds of more options for producing interesting designs and doing interesting things with glass that they could never do with cutting, okay? Because the cutting that you saw, or the cutting that you see is always usually in straight lines, okay? And before the Second World War, it was largely done on stone wheels, and then they had to do this, like, it was a very involved process, essentially. Like, once it got past the Second World War, then they started using diamond wheels, and then it got super quick, and that's essentially led to the the kind of revival of cut crystal around the 70s, you know, 60s and 70s, whatever, and then, like, the, you know, ABP just kind of exploded again. Anyway, getting ahead of myself. Rewind back to the late 19th century, early 20th century, an American, early American pattern glass. Pattern glass essentially looks a lot like this, okay? They started making mostly clear cut, clear crystal, all right? And it was not really lead crystal, it was all like, it was like you have to use um, a, an element to clarify glass, all right? Normal kind of glass without anything added to it is not completely clear, okay? It just isn't. It's, um, you have to end, you end up having to add stuff to it in order to make it clear, okay? And when they were making EAPG, they started adding things like manganese to it. Now, these days, they don't do that. They add things like selenium, okay? There's a whole bunch more of the chemistry that I have no clue about and I'm not hugely interested in because it's not hugely relevant to the actual, you know, collecting kind of stuff. The most important thing, though, is that if you're looking at EAPG, by and large, it will fluoresce like a, like a, a lime, like a, a stronger green color. It is not the neon green of uranium because it just, it just don't. And uranium glass by and large is actually green. It's not clear, okay? Like it'll be like green or yellow or sometimes very rarely blue. And it will always have like the, it always has some kind of a tint with it. It doesn't have this, um, just, just plain clear, okay? So what have I got here? It's a green one, obviously, all right? Now, this is actually not EAPG. This is the pattern of EAPG, but this is a later reproduction. Okay, they didn't really do this kind of green. Well, I mean, they did do this, something of this kind of color or whatever like that, but not not like this. The patterns don't make sense because we have two separate patterns here. Okay, they there was definitely this this type of of cup goblet, whatever you want to call it, that had this pattern 
called the eye winker. It's a very famous pattern, actually, and it was done by Northwood. And then you have this one here, which is called the slanted S. OK, and that was actually done by another company. I don't think it was Northwood. I think it was. Um, maybe Imperial off the top of my head, but I can't remember. Anyway, the important thing is that, like, although this might be made from the right kind of glass, even though they, I mean, they, they be, I, some of them did kind of green like this, whatever. It's it's not because the patterns don't make sense. OK, and I actually picked this up as a kind of a, a kind of for interest, if nothing else, because I saw this, recognized that these were two well-known EAPG patterns, but I'd never seen them together before. And I got it just kind of on curiosity. I spent like a dollar on it or something and went into the Facebook groups and kind of referenced this. And they basically said, eh, it's a fantasy item. It's like someone takes some like some popular EAPG patterns, shoves them together, makes a reproduction. And this is what you get. You know, I'm going to keep this for myself. All right. Now, let's sit that to one side. OK. Early Amer not early American pattern dust, but has some of the kind of patterns of EAPG, okay? Because a lot of them did this kind of like elaborate kind of swirl kind of stuff, all right? And they did like uh, like combinations of like the, the cut patterns and things like hob stars, if you've seen the big swirly kind of layering kind of pinwheel looking things. Like they, they, they mimicked a lot of the cut patterns and then added extra elements and kind of made things more like different and interesting. There was a lot of kind of experimentation. They did a whole, like it's a whole field of study. Okay. Fascinating shit. I personally love the stuff, even if nobody else does. Nobody really collects it. It's not super popular. It sells for nothing. I don't fucking care. I love it. Anyway, that's that. And now you get to see this. All right. And what this is, this is a real piece of the APG in the eye winker pattern. OK, um, and you can see the differences or whatever, because if you compare the two, this is a very wide eye, whatever you want to call it. And this is a very small one. And it's kind of like a little bit similar between the little you know, whatever. That's not it's not quite the, the same. So this is far more of a traditional APG thing. OK, and Curiously enough, this particular pattern was reproduced up to the obviously up to the 20th century by Moser, one of the big American glass companies that are done very high quality glass. I bought this for five dollars because I looked at it and thought the chances are it's one of the older ones by Northwood. Still, the jury is still kind of out on that. I'm not 100 percent sure. I personally think it is one of the older cups because it is made in a three piece mold. There is a line, a seam here and a seam at three points. So three piece mold, three piece leaf mold. So this thing would have been uh, like they they basically press them upside down. I left the price tag on it. Press it upside down and like they would have one piece of one third of the mold would be actually fixed onto the base and then two other leaf pieces would be here and here. And then when they actually press the glass in, um, you know, because they obviously want to, you know, to make the piece, press it in, let it cool or whatever like that. And then they take two pieces away and then lift this out, you know, any anyway, anyway. That is like a material. The The cool thing about this is that this is actually the legitimate eye winker pattern. It was real name of the pattern was called Genoese for some bizarre reason. But this is a really great example of like early American pattern glass and the kind of weird stuff that they were trying to do now that they were kind of like recognizing the possibilities of having pressed glass as opposed to just having cut glass, you know, it's like like how, how, how nuts can we get with this? And you can see that they also have this lovely blue tint with a little bit of opalescence here at the bottom and a lovely white opalescence here at the top. And this this stuff here, this opalescent glass became effectively the precursor to milk glass that really kind of got going in like the 50s. And uh, like, I mean, a little bit like it was kind of a bit earlier as well. But like there, there's a, two types effectively of milk glass and they were essentially trying to replicate the look and feel of very high quality porcelain in glass because they figure it was easier to obviously make stuff out of milk glass than it was to make high quality porcelain, you know. And, that, and so milk glass got super popular, right? It, it started to pick up like this, like like the no, I think the 20s or 30s, and then that was like the more opalescent style of milk glass, like this stuff. And then anchor hawking really went kind of crazy in the 50s and 60s, and really started to crank out milk glass. And yeah, and then the the stuff that everybody sees now in thrift stores is that's mostly what you see there. It's completely worthless because nobody wants it anymore. Nobody's into, into milk glass unless it's the really old stuff like the Victorian opalescent or whatever stuff. Anyway, this probably about 100 years old. Paid five bucks for it. I fucking love it. I would love to get a whole set of this particular pattern. This would have been a juice cup that comes with like a pitcher, you know, like with the, you know, for water or juice or whatever the hell you want. Like I will probably sell it, though, because like 
even if this were new, it would be worth about 15 to 20 dollars, like Canadian, I guess. I don't know what you even called it. I don't know what that is in freedom books, so don't ask. Um, but I don't know, I'll see. It's nice enough and it's in great condition. So I will see what I can sell it for. And I'll leave those two over there for now. Lovely, lovely pieces. And like, oh yeah, like I said, I have been busy. <laughs> so there is a quick kind of like five seconds, like, you know, the stuff that I randomly remember about <laughs> APG. Um, I've been, I've been quite busy the last while, but just because I've been like, essentially going out to thrift stores and picking stuff up, because like I've said before, Vancouver, for no fucking reason, is swimming in early American pattern glass. Like, the thrift stores are chock-a-block full of it, and I think it's because nobody really wants it, nobody really collects it anymore, which I find really disappointing, okay? Because some of it is incredibly beautiful, and it's incredibly hard-wearing stuff, I swear to God. Like, I pick up modern glass in thrift stores and I'm super disappointed by just how, how do you call it? I, it is, it is light and fragile and feels like, it feels like you couldn't pick it up and whack it off somebody's head and knock them out. And I'm just like, why would you bother having a fruit bowl that you couldn't brain someone with? It just defeats the entire purpose. Hi, KK, how's it going? <laughs> Let's, I'm just like, I, I like my glass to be, to be vintage and also double as, you know, as a, a weapon in times of need. Like, I, I, I think you should, you should, you should have goals or whatever for, for your dinnerware. And one of them should be that they should double as, you know, home defense should you ever need it. Because we are in the land of maple syrup and they have different laws about self-defense and um, carrying of weapons and all that other jazz and like as far as I know they don't take kindly on like you having a gun and shooting people and whatever I don't know I'm just I'm just look I'm just saying I'm just saying okay I would have absolutely no fear of taking one a big a big heavy actually I have one I'm going to show you hold on where is it oh come on it's got a rabbit in it right now wait oh so the other thing is that they're super heavy hold on I'm going to just no, don't fall over. Don't, don't fall over. Don't fall over. Son of a... Stay! Oh. Okay, fuck you then. Just... Ah! Stay. Stay. I'm dropping everything. See? Oh my god. Okay, I'm just gonna put that down. I always have crap all over my desk. Alright? Always. Always. I'm very sorry, tired, but happy. My friends got married yesterday. I assisted with set up and tear down, but it was worth it because I love them. Oh my God, that's con congratulations. That sounds like, I love weddings. I always cry at weddings. <laughs> All right. Wah. Okay. Here is a prime example of what I would consider like another piece of classic early American pattern glass because this enormous first start and it's kind of a pressed version that takes off the, 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 the cut patterns of ABP, all right? So you can imagine very well that it looks like that this stuff might actually be cut, okay? All right, it's not. This is actually a pressed glass bowl, okay? This is a fruit bowl and it was made by Heise. It's actually got the Heise mark right here in the middle that you can't really see on camera, okay? Now, this thing, oh, this thing weighs, I would say, I'm gonna say it weighs about four pounds. Like that's, you could do you could do like curls or whatever with it. It's a fucking heavy piece of glass, all right. And it is also incredibly tough stuff. It is about half an inch thick, or a bit more. This thing is enormous, all right. Half an inch of glass here, okay. Um, I'm pretty sure that if I grabbed it like this and bashed the wall with it, it would go straight through the wall. This thing would not break. The the wall, the drywall would give away first. Okay. And that's what I mean. Like, I kind of imagine taking a fruit bowl and today, like made a modern fruit bowl, okay, and being able to put it through a piece of drywall. Not a chance. This one sucker, however, like, no, this thing's gonna survive. And this is incredibly tough glass. Like, it has quite a bit of wear on the base that you probably can't see very well. Like that has a lot of kind of scratches and a little bit of kind of like grayishness here because it has been you know slid across the table quite a bit over its over its lifetime, but considering that it's over a hundred years old, like it is in phenomenally good condition. I think there's one chip I found 
somewhere on the inside and I can't find it now. Oh wait, no, there we go. There is one small chip there. That's it. You're telling me I can smash someone's skull in with this? Dude, you could smash anything with a person with this. I swear to God. If you hit someone in the head with this, you would easily crack their skull. This thing is huge and weighs a fucking ton. Massive amount of glass here. I actually bought it for 10 bucks in the thrift store, okay? Because I picked it up, saw a heisey thing, and I'm like, whoa, we've got some good stuff, and I decided, okay, I'm going to take that. Actual name of the pattern is called Pinwheel and Fan. Um, if you wanted to buy this online, you would probably spend more on shipping than you would on the actual bowl itself. Bowl usually goes for, I don't know, 20 to $30 Canadian. Probably, you know, with the exchange rate, that's going to be less than Freedom Books. I don't know. But you're going to pay through the nose to ship this thing because it's so heavy. But yeah, like, I am seriously considering at this point taking my current fruit bowl and replacing it with this because my current fruit bowl is a modern fruit bowl and it keeps falling over. Not even kidding. This, however, will hold like a stack of fruit like how high and there's no way it's going to fall over or roll off the thing. It's just like you can't move it. It's fucking heavy. Anyway, I'm going to put it down. Leave that over there. Yeah. So if you want to actually compare with that because again, we're not quite done with the glass lesson, right? I also have this. So we've gone from super big, heavy and tough to crystal. And oopsie daisy. This is an actual Victorian mustard pot. And this is cut crystal, all right? And hopefully you can see the difference between this and the other stuff <laughs> because this sparkles. Um, and I know this sounds really kind of stupid, all right? But it honestly does, all right? The crystal itself does sparkle. The really old stuff as well, when they were making it with actual like flint glass, which is a particular type of glass. It's not the same as leaded glass. Not quite anyway, it's kind of mid, mid 19th century. That has a, has a sparkle to it that I cannot quite describe but it's definitely there and it does not look like modern stuff. And it is very, it's very pure and very distinctive. It's almost like a diamond, all right? Yeah. But this, this is cut, this is like ABP cut crystal. And this lovely little mustard pot actually has its original lid, all right? It's in fantastic condition. And it also has its original little spoon. And the spoon actually might be silver. It's, I can't tell the mark is worn away, so. I actually don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know either. But anyway, I bought this in a thrift store for, I don't know, what, five bucks? Because I picked it up and said, way, I know what that is. And I thought some collector is going to wee their pants over this. But yeah, that's what that looks like. I'm going to, something to gouge some lines. I actually, I wouldn't because look, these, these little spoons and everything like that. Look, they, these are so much more delicate than than EAPG, it's kind of a bit shocking that I found this one in as good condition as it is. What happens to this stuff is that because all of the edges are so sharp when they're cut, all of the like all of these little points and everything get completely wrecked. As in they like they'll be moved and they'll bounce off stuff and then they'll chip. Okay. They chip really, really easily. It's not the same as in modern glass. Modern crystal tends not to. Okay. This though, I've seen plenty of times I've seen American Brilliant Cut Crystal in a thrift store and they're charging like 15, 20 dollars for something and it will be literally destroyed as in part of the pattern is essentially gone because all of these sharp edges and points are just chipped away completely. Like I just I've seen pretty sh stupid shitty stuff basically in thrift stores. I spent far too long. I spent far too much time in them basically. OK, I'm going to put this away now. I don't think anything else down here is actually really interesting or at least I haven't identified it yet apart from like a really massive, like, I think they call it a banana stand and I have no idea why, but that one's not, that one's not really interesting. Anyway, I got to get back and actually do crochet now. Yeah. But look, 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 like, like ABP is like its own, it's, it's, it's really its own thing. I don't know if anyone really seriously uses it or they just collect it because they think it looks sparkly, you know? I don't really know if anyone actually uses it seriously. And I say this as someone who actually is a glass collector and I don't collect, like, I don't collect glass to actually use, you know? I collect glass because I like to look at it, not because I like to use it for any ring. Like the the most glass that I will, was this from the, the Lost Valley Village? Oh God, no, no, <laughs> it was not. I think the last, let me think. What was the last piece of glass I got out of that place? I'm blanking now. 
I'd have to actually go and check my records because I keep a record of everything. No, I don't. Uh... Oh, I think it was that weird glass. Yeah, okay, okay. I think I actually have it here. There is a weird glass vase that I can't identify. And I think this is the last one I picked out of it. Look at this. Yeah, tell me this is fucking weird, right? This is totally weird. And it is actually signed in the base by someone whose handwriting is so bad I can't read it. Okay. This is hand-blown art glass, obviously. And it's done using a splatter technique. You can see the, the, the thing there. And it's also done with a kind of stretch thing that's kind of pulled up these two little handles. A three, oh, I mean, look, look, I just, I wouldn't put it past it, but I swear to God, glass artists and their signatures, some of them need to go back to fucking school, I tell you what, because they just cannot write legibly. I have no idea why. It drives me crazy. But it makes doing ID incredibly annoying. Like, and it's always the North American guys. I don't think I've ever had an issue reading a signature from any Scandinavian art, glass artist. Okay. I'm pretty sure I've like, I've had trouble finding them. I've never once had an issue actually reading what they wrote. Okay. Even though it's in another fucking language. No, North American guys, squiggle, squiggle, squiggle. And there's sometimes a number, which could be the date or it could be something else. Who the fuck knows? Are they going to rebuild it or is it just going to be a lot? Now, you know, I don't know. I kind of want them to rebuild it. I just expect that they're not going to because that's not how Valley Village rolls. They may open a new one nearby. Who knows? Like, big part of the neighborhood up there and I don't think there's any other Valley Village nearby. So, make it that which you will. Kind of looks like a snail. Like, yeah, look, I just picked this up because, like, for $4, I didn't think I was going to go wrong with it. Art glass is always fun. Especially weird shit. Like, weird shit sells. True. Anyway, I'm going to put that back down there. Okay, so if I, just just in case anybody cares, today's lovely flavor is grapefruit, and I have a lime in backup, just on the off chance that I need it. Oh, Christ. Okay. Crochet. As soon as I wipe my hands. Oh, okay. I can do this. I'm American, have unreadable signature, I agree. Yeah. Tell me about it, I tell you what. Oh, come on, just to do with the... I swear, this pattern is going to break my heart. I'm just, I may just work on another thing that I've got here instead, just because this is so fucking annoying. Like, the only other problem is that the other thing that I've got to work on is teeny deeny diny. And I don't know if I want to... I don't know if I'm going to do that on, on like stream. I think I don't think anyone's going to be super interested in that. Where are we? Okay, here we go. Let's... Yeah, join. And that is stupid, awkward join. And really should have been done with the other color. Make it at least somewhat consistent. Like, the interesting thing about this technique is that it does it does work I think quite well when you get it right but the problem is that you have to constantly weave everything back and forth like you have to be rather careful like I like if I like if I'm if I'm going to be joining two colors here okay <laughs> you're doing two color no I never do two color things this is like this is a new one so we're like this okay and I need to make sure that this yarn is as close as possible to the active stitch of this yarn. They're essentially the same active stitch because all I'm doing is like transferring the active stitch over back over and back between the two yarns. Okay, so pull this here, wrap that back, lock it. So now we have at the back of the active stitch we have the two yarns coming out. Okay, I'm trying very hard not to carry the thread behind here. Okay, I don't want that to happen. I want to weave it in as much as possible. Okay, because there is nothing that is a bigger issue for tension than when, like, the the yarn is the, it gets carried in in the back. It just it makes shit go sideways so fast, and it drives me nuts. It really does. So we're gonna do our level best not to do that. I just killed my Windows taskbar. Congratulations. Good job. Hope you feel proud of yourself. Okay, all right, let's continue with this. So, KK, in case you're wondering, this particular thing that I'm doing is effectively a double strand color work, but I'm using, well, I mean, a technique which is clearly slightly fucked up because I've been fucking it up now for like at least, like 
I'm doing it completely wrong and I'm starting the end of the row here. Yeah, so I've been, I'm doing this, but then cocking, cocking it up. Like the way that I'm doing this, right, is that there is essentially two yarns coming out. Okay. And I have one in either hand, right? I am using pen grip, modified pen grip with English throwing style and with the yarn on this side as if I was doing pen grip. So essentially I could do pen grip and English throwing side at the same time and just swap between the yarns. And if I do it this way, this means that I can effectively, I can effectively work two colors at the same time on every single loop. I can just choose which one I'm pulling through. Like I can work both. And this makes it remarkably easy to do double strand color work, especially if you're doing this, so essentially something as weird as this, which is I'm trying to make all the tops of the double crochet for this particular pattern, just the one color. Okay. And if I was doing anything other than a fan, you would probably not be able to see them. But in this case, you can kind of see the, you can see it because like the fan anchor above is not, is like, you can see here that like all the tops of these stitches, like the doubles or whatever like that, this, just this one loop is essentially the gray but it gets, it gets like hidden here because the black of the stitch above wraps over it and hides it. And this is where you get this weird kind of like, you know, arrow looking fucking pattern, which I'm not sure I'm actually happy about at all. The inside of it has that pattern, which I think might look a bit more interesting. I don't know. This is what we call a big ass fucking experiment. And we're just going to continue because I'm committed. And I generally do not double up on my on my projects. I work one thing at a time. I sometimes have experimental stuff, but I have one main project and nothing else. And I do not work on any other main projects until I am done with this one. It generally means bags because I am all about making astronomical amounts of bags, even when it's fucking ridiculous. And this particular pattern is kind of a variant of a, like a bag pattern that I've been kind of tooling around with. And I don't know if I'm entirely happy with it yet because there is, it's still coming out with an odd number of squares at the top and I can't quite get the handles to attach properly. But this is like, this is basically just structural stuff, which I will be fixing eventually. I just need to work out how to make sure that I have the correct number of, of stitches. Like when I actually land at the, how would you do it? Like when the, when this base is done, okay. I need to have the correct number of stitches in the rim in order to get an even number of C2C crochet blocks when I actually start working the body. And so far I have not quite managed that on the number of increases that I've done, which means that I may need to just essentially go to a bigger or smaller base just so that the number of increases precisely lines up with the number of, with the number of C2C blocks that I need. Because if I don't have an even number then I can't attach the handles without it looking weird. Long story. Look, that's, that's crochet. Just, um, I'm pretty sure I don't make a whole lot of sense anyway. So yeah, don't worry about that. It's just, I know, I know what I mean. I know what I mean. I'm pretty sure that no one else does. And I'm pretty sure that I make no fucking sense, but you know, I'm used to it. It's fine. Anyway, in other news, in other news, kids, uh, I was not on last week because my dad had another stroke. Um, he is out of the hospital right now, but last week was like, well, basically the week before I didn't stream, like that was, uh, rather, rather difficult and kind of came out of the left field or whatever like that, because like I was even on stream and stuff like that on that Sunday. And then on the Tuesday, my mom and my sister called and said, oh yeah, dad's back in the hospital or something. And I'm like, you know, they, they could have, they could have warned me. They could have warned me in some other way, but look, 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 dad is fine. Like he's okay. He had, didn't have a full stroke. It was like a minor stroke or whatever that thing they, they, they look so like he's back to his usual crotchety self. As far as I can tell, it has done absolutely nothing to him, which is about the best I can hope for, you know, like doesn't really help that my grandfather had a stroke in his sixties and subsequently died at the age of 75. And my dad is turning 71 this year. Okay. So like, it, it could be better, could be better. Just saying, but I'm trying not to think about it. You know, 
uh, he's a tough old guy, and I'm pretty sure that my mom is going to make sure that he does whatever he needs to do, which is generally what they tell you everybody to do, which is like, hey, lay off the booze, get exercise, eat healthy, and you know, that kind of, I don't know, that kind of stuff. The mini stroke thing. Yeah, like it's not a real stroke. It's like this, uh, uh, they had some word for it. It's a TIA. I don't know what that is. I'm not a medical person. They just said that it was like, it was not a full blown stroke. He just had this like a, a, a minor stroke that was just like this, this warning, whatever. I don't know. It just, it, it I, I don't know. Like, I just like th the first I heard about it. Okay. It was that they said dad's in hospital. He had this thing that like looked like a stroke for about 10, 20 minutes. And I'm like, the what now? And part of the reason that this was so stressful. Okay. Is that when I was told that when I was told that dad was back in hospital, right? I could not go home. Okay. I'm literally on the other side of the fucking world. I am in Vancouver. He is obviously in Ireland. All right. And that is, that is something because at the time, my beloved Quadrain was actually back in Ireland and there was no one, there would be no one to take care of the kids. Like I was here with the kids. He was back in Ireland for his mom's birthday or whatever. Like it, it's, you know, long story, but look like long and short of it is that like, that was like, that was a solid week. Okay. Where I was quite literally shitting bricks and not really wanting to talk to anyone. Cause I was trying to like consider what was happen if like something happened to my dad and I wouldn't be able to go home, you know? Wouldn't be able to go home and see him. And if anyone's been on the channel a while, you know that like that when my godmother died, that was essentially what happened. Because it was the middle of COVID and now I, I couldn't go home to see her, you know? And that hit me pretty hard. And still not over it. Still not entirely over it. But look, it is what it is. My dad's okay. And I've kind of you know, just kind of dealing with that, you know, and it's like, it's not fun. Don't get me wrong, but like, you know, better than it could be. Anyway, I've got a lot of stuff to be doing now, especially things to do with like, with antiques. Okay. Because on a word of a lie, I spent a lot of time going around to all the antique stores, essentially around Vancouver and telling them, Hey, can I nerd, essentially like nerding out at people about glass. Okay. Oh, the hell of a thing. And like, I got to go into the, I got to go into the one, the one antique store on. So I, mean, I don't know if you ever know, if any of you guys know Vancouver, right? But there's a place called Main Street, all right? Because there's always a place called Main Street. It's fucking, every town has one. Okay. In Vancouver, Main Street is also called Antiques Alley because there's a whole bunch of antique stores that are like right next to each other. Okay. I went there yesterday with a friend of mine, with, with a friend of mine, with, with, uh, with Wild Nomad actually. And we just like, we went to a gar, we went to a garage sale and I, picked up some early 20th century like depression uranium glass for fucking nothing a pair of really nice fostoria etched um goblets which like i'm not entirely sure they knew what they had but i was like fucking sell that shit to me please anyway got those went around to a bunch of went to like one of the salvation armies bought much more stuff <laughs> Like generally had a very good day. And I talked to a lot of people about glass, even though I have to say talking to people absolutely wears me out. I've kind of accepted that this is now part of the job and you got to do it. You may not, you know, it, you know, you're going to, you're going to occasionally get overwhelmed and not want to do anything with people for a very long time. But like, you know, you know, you, you, you do what you can. Okay. You do what you can. And you know, it's, I always have my crochet with me at this point and that definitely helps my whole mental state kind of thing. Anyway, anyway, spent a long time going around to all of these antique stores. Okay. And just looking at a lot of the glass and I actually, oh God, guys, I got to hold, hold a real galley vase. Now, I don't know if any of you guys are into glass, especially old antique glass. Okay. Or if you, or if you know who Galley is, all right, if, I'm totally, you know, if you don't know who he is, that's, I mean, that's, that's okay. Like, it's fine. But I, I saw these in the cabinet, right? Well, the, the, the tall foreign guy, his older guy, who is must be European of some kind or whatever, was just like, I was just like pointing out stuff going, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. And then, and he was like, oh, you know, he was like happy to show me stuff. All right. Because as far as he's concerned, like, you know, oh yeah, you know, just, you should invest in some of this, you know, it's good. And I was like, oh, oh man, A, I don't have the money. B, don't have the space. Don't tempt me. Okay. Seriously. 
but he showed me, he was happy to show me the galley vase. And I was just like, oh God, oh God, oh God, do not let me drop this. Do not let me drop this. Do not let me drop this. How much is a galley worth? How much is a galley worth? Um, off the top of my head, several thousand dollars. I better not drop this. <laughs> and there was a pair of them. Okay. And he handed me one of them. If I dropped one of them, the one that he had would be would go down in price because like you you the two of them together are the ones that are actually worth the money. Okay, now the galley lamps are the 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 beautiful Art Nouveau like like acid etched lamps. Okay, like, they, those are the stuff of fucking legend. There's thirty thousand dollars in just one of those lamps. All right, I, God help me if I ever actually come across a real one, I may die. I'm just saying, but like the money in this case would have been the two together and I was guessing just because I don't do a whole lot of very expensive early 20th century glass I just generally never see it but I know something about how much it's worth and I was thinking 10 grand 15 grand easily for this pair and god help me if I drop this because I do not have that kind of money <laughs> I absolutely don't however I got to hold this and it's if you're a glass nerd then that's really that's really good it's oh, just holding something that you've never that you've never like you've never seen before you know holding something really that you know is a very special thing and if you've seen like if you've seen like knockoffs of the good stuff it is very much night and day if you actually get something that's real in your hands you know it's and it's a great feeling to actually see it like it like i have never actually seen like knockoff uh, uh Loetz or tiffany fabriel or anything like that you know I don't know if I'd recognize it if I saw it. All right. I've seen knockoffs of other stuff and I think that the difference is fairly stark, you know? Um, like I've seen uh, people doing knockoffs of Robert Held's work, you know? But I have actual real work by Robert Held, you know? I know the difference quite well. But like, if I, like, I don't know what I'd do if I came up with something that, that pr essentially purports to be Lois or Tiffany. But the it is really it is really important anyway for me to just like to go to an antique store and talk to other antique dealers and then have a chance to actually handle the real thing 15 grand for a single pair of glasses <laughs> so the fine art market ain't the only place okay where the prices get really fucking stupid i'll tell you what because did you guys hear about the auction for the pyrex bowl oh man <laughs> The Pyrex Bowl. Oh boy. So, okay, so here's here's a little, here's some trivia for you, okay? Pyrex collectors, all right, are serious fucking business and they have been serious business for years. I know, just great way to launder money. Oh, like you would not believe. Like if I ever, if I ever actually get into that, by the way, first of all, I'm not telling you guys, but I will definitely become a millionaire. I'm just saying, you know, I'm not above super villainy. But anyway, okay, yeah, <laughs> the Pyrex Bowl, okay. Now, there are, as far as I know, several private groups on Facebook that deal solely with the, what are called the very serious collectors of Pyrex. If you were just going, if you have like just, if you have like, say, for example, an entire set of like, of like pink, like pink Amish butter print, right? You know, if you've spent like several hundred dollars just collecting just just that, you know, up to a thousand dollars doing that, right? You were not serious enough. You were not anywhere near serious enough. OK. You would have to be going for the absolute rarest of the rare. OK. And one of those, like the really the rarest Pyrex bowl that you could ever that you that, that has ever been made is called Lucky in Love and is literally, I swear to God, it was a promo item of some fucking kind and it is a white, um, a white borosilicate, you know, casserole dish <laughs> with a particular pattern of fucking hearts on it. OK, I'm not bullshitting you. That is the rarest, the rarest of the rare, the cream of the crop. If you have one of these, all right, you have. Yeah, no, seriously, Pyrex has also did like collect, also did like or back in the day, they also did collectible um, like casserole dishes with patterns and shit on them. And they were doing them from about the 40s up to maybe about the 80s, all right? And they're super fucking collectible now. Oh, hey, I've got a Joe0412. Thank you very much for... Yes, the measuring cups. Oh, my God. Google Pyrex dishes. You'll see the patterns. Pyrex di Just look at Pyrex patterns. You'll see a list of them, okay? Look, 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 look. Just thank you for following. We're having a whole moment here because 
Pyrotito needs to understand about the vintage, the vintage glass part. Okay, yeah. So Pyrex did all of these kind of really neat kind of like mid-century um, like patterns essentially on casserole dishes and shit. And they did all these big patterns, you know, I think cups and dishes and mostly bakeware and a bunch more stuff. No, seriously, man. Anyway, Lucky in Love is the rarest that they ever did. And there, if you have a Lucky in Love casserole dish, right, you have instant admission to any of the most private groups, all right? Because you have now proved yourself you were now a serious, serious collector. There's no other way of getting into these. Anyway, recently on eBay, on eBay, a Lucky in Love casserole dish went up on auction. And the winning bid was $22,000. In case you think that uh, Pyrex collectors are, <laughs> are, you know, anyway reserved and how much money they'll throw with their old dishes, there you go. Winning bid, $22,000. I'm knitting since six years old and I'm 24 now. I think my Nana have some of these. Oh, they actually do. Just, just check. Okay, some of the rare patterns are worth serious, serious paper. I'm telling you right. And I'm French living in South Korea. Ah, bienvenue. <laughs> That's about it. I know some French. Some. So. I do know how to knit. We are, we are crocheting here, even though we're crocheting weird. But I also talk a lot about glass because I am an antique dealer who specializes in glass. And we sometimes get into discussions about Pyrex. Anyway, Ricardito, go look at the Pyrex. And look at the Lucky in Love, like, auction, okay? And when you can scrape your floor, you, your jaw up off the floor, right, come back. And I thought I was spending $100 on a Pokemon card. <laughs> the Pokemon collection thing is, like, small fry. Some of the, yeah, no, seriously. Some of the, the really rare Pyrex can go for fucking insane money. Not even kidding, man. Some of it can go seriously, seriously bad. And I, and I mean, like, I make a point of, like, picking up the really good patterns when I spot them because I know which ones are kind of desirable. And, like, I turned... I spent, what, $30, I think, on a couple of bowls. And I think I made something like $200 off that just because the patterns were rare, you know? Just just saying, like, Pyrex is, like, is, is big money if you can get the right stuff. I helped my friend last week in the container that has some of her Pyrex pants slipped. Oh, oh, that feels so bad. Oh, no. I learned crochet just a bit since only a few months ago. Oh, yeah. Well, look, look, crochet is a good thing to learn. It's very forgiving. It's very flexible. It is definitely a sister craft to knitting. Knitting, I, I believe, is better for doing garments. Like, if you want something with a lot of drape in it, then knitting is the way to go. Do not bother with crochet for that kind of stuff. Crochet is very good for is very good for um, things like structural work or very delicate or very complex lace patterns. Knitting is good at lace. It will never be able to match what what crochet can do. Like crochet lace is on, on another level. Um, crochet, because it also is like the tying of knots and everything like that, it has the advantage in actually producing kind of structural stuff. You can crochet a much stiffer and and more kind of structure friendly, like like fabric using crochet than you can with knitting. So there's something to consider. Just my random opinion, because I do know, I do know how to knit and crochet. I mostly crochet, though. I probably wouldn't sell them too many memories, but if I did, I sell them to the universe. Yes, please do. <laughs> $4,000 for a measuring cup. Yep, sounds about right. Like, if someone says, oh, yes, $4,000 for this particular, like, like a, like a pink, a pink Amish brother print with the woman on the left, and I was just like, damn, that's probably, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> yeah. Like, I had a, a teal um, Amish Butterprint bowl that I bought for 12 and that sold for $120 just because it was one of the good ones and it was rare, you know? And so, like, the and it's not even just Pyrex, all right? Pyrex is one of the, like, the, the like, just, there's more than just Pyrex. Mid-century dishes, especially, like, of a certain, of a certain style, tend to be very, very popular. It's 2000 for a fucking pencil. No, just look, look, dude, they're, 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 people collect what they like, you know? People think that I'm fucking nuts for spending the amount of money that I do on art glass, but like, I I like Robert Held stuff. I buy it when I see it, you know? I have a $200 Robert Held vase sitting over there in the corner, which I'm probably never going to get rid of because I love it to bits and then someone it makes me so happy. But like, I also was in, when I was in an antique store, okay, I also saw a pair of Archimede Seguso hand-blown camels. Seriously, a pair of camel, glass camels, 
all right, in this kind of, I want to call like yellow green kind of satin glass, okay? Fucking camels, they look like cartoon characters. Price for the two of these, if you wanted to buy them, $1,800, okay? And that was probably, I was probably a really good bargain considering it was by Seguso himself, all right? Archimedes Seguso or whatever is one of the, like the, the Murano glass masters of the early 20th century. Like, I don't know if I would be able to sell a piece by him if I did acquire one. I think I would probably cry if I had to sell it because like, obviously he's dead now and his work is incredibly rare and desirable because it was all individually hand blown or whatever like that. And so if you get something that's signed by him, that's a, that's a whole other, that's a whole other thing. But that's like art, you know, people just, they like their art, but people like to collect, you know, this is just the whole thing. People love to collect. And I know a lot of people who actually use their old Pyrex, like they, they will use it for, they will use it for its intended purpose. They'll use it for serving. They don't even put like, some people make displays out of it, but a lot of people like take their old Pyrex and use it for its intended purpose. You know, they use it for dinnerware or whatever. And they just enjoy the fact that they have like vintage dishes that, you know, have lasted a very, very long time. They're very high quality, you know, and you know, it's this part of like, part of it is the flex, you know, you get to uh, get an amazing casserole dish and then serve, you know, I some kind of lasagna in it to all your your bougie hipster friends or something. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just like all my own glassware that I actually use on a regular basis is from IKEA. I'm just just saying. I don't do like serving work for myself. That would be that would be insane. I have children and a dishwasher. Just oh yeah. Um this is a this is also now a PSA by the way. Do not do not put vintage Pyrex into a dishwasher. If you put vintage Pyrex into a dishwasher, I will personally come to your house and slap the shit out of you. There is nothing worse, okay, than walking into a thrift store and seeing a really nice Pyrex bowl, which has been completely fucking destroyed by dishwasher damage to the point where it is now worthless, okay? They're not making that shit anymore. And it makes me fucking cry every time I see it. And I have seen Oh yeah, okay, well, look, let's stretch and I'll continue ranting. Oh, yeah. Oh, those are my shoulders. I still get that crunch because my left is still completely buggered up for what it's worth. Anyway, so, so vintage Pyrex, all right. I've been at least three or four times. I've walked into a thrift store and seen a bowl that would be worth up to like $50 sitting there on the shelf for two bucks and it will not even sell for that because it's been so badly damaged. Okay, vintage Pyrex is worth money and I swear to God, if for no other reason, please do not put it in the dishwasher because every time it goes through a dishwasher and takes a little bit more damage, it loses a little bit more of its value. Just please, 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 please don't put it in the dishwasher. Wash it by hand. Oh. And I actually say this as someone who has a set of Cinderella bowls, okay? It's the, the forest mushroom pattern or whatever. I got them a while ago beautiful baking bowls right that sit in my in my bottom drawer and I never use them because the bowls that I actually use for baking are shitty stainless steel ones that I got I don't know in Canadian Tire at some point and I use them because I like to shove them in the dishwasher and I don't care if they get completely fucked I'm just like I don't just let them let them die I don't care they're just metal I'll take them to recycling if it becomes an issue Ugh. Anyway, for the love of God, stop destroying your vintage Pyrex. It's, it's, it's like, it's actually getting depressing at this point. I just, I can't take it anymore. Come on, like. Oh, and I need to weave that one in. Just, ah! Work with me. Okay. <sighs> redo, 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 redo. All right, we're going to slip stitch join. Wrap that there, pull it through, start going up. Now we're good. Right. Okay. Because I have to think through an entire series of actions. And it doesn't help that the room is kind of hot and sweaty. Because we had to close the window this morning because the asshole crows were being loud and obnoxious at like fucking 6 a.m. And you want to know how angry I was about that? The answer is very. 
yeah actually oh fuck this i'm just gonna open the window hold on hold on hold on let's do the thing come on close the window you're you're gonna maybe get the signs of the alleyway right next to my bedroom oh well okay number of times i've kicked shit underneath my desk Moment of silence for our fallen vintage Pyrex friends who have died to the dishwasher. Just fucking don't tell me about it. It's like, I like, see, the worst part is when I know the stuff is actually worth money. And I'm like, what, what absolute asshole put this in a dishwasher? Like, they clearly didn't know. Okay. But at this point, I was just like, how did you not know that this was happening? Like, did you not see the damage being done and just decided that you were okay with that? Like, what the fuck? Like, it just, ugh disappointing super disappointing and like it is just a thing with a lot of very old like glasses like anything that was kind of made before dishwashers were a thing like just don't don't rely on that getting through the dishwasher in one piece chances are it's going to get destroyed like just it's a given okay i don't know of any piece of like really nice old glass that would survive like multiple trips to the dishwasher like you will even notice all right and i definitely do dishwasher damaged crystal is is really heartbreaking <laughs> like i've come across some stuff that's been very badly dishwasher damaged and like the crystal goes all cloudy but it's not even just that the texture gets the texture gets just gets destroyed okay and it's like how would you describe it it likes it gets kind of clammy i guess and it's almost like sick glass it's like the this like the surface of the glass just starts to break down it is truly upsetting especially when you know what, what it's supposed to look like and it could literally just like you could just have washed it with basic dish soap you would have gotten all the dirt off anyway you don't need to put that shit in the dishwasher there is nothing that will stick to vintage glass that, that you need to, that you'd need to put it in a dishwasher to try and get it off dishwasher is not for that like modern glass to be honest, I have a few pieces that I'll just chuck in there and I don't care. I think I have one or two coffee cups that might be anchor hockey and from the 80s. But I can safely say that I give absolutely zero fucks about whether or not that gets destroyed by the dishwasher because they're literally just like, it's a glass coffee cup. It's like when that finally gives up the ghost or I break it or something like that, I will walk into a thrift store, pay a dollar and get a new one new you know question you know new to me not new to everybody else obviously it's second hand you know but like yeah it's like i i don't buy nice glass for my own use i buy it for me to look at and occasionally because like i find it weird or interesting like the apg cups and funnily enough i actually do have a pair of really nice like i have a, I have a pair of nice like murano cups but they're modern murano so like they're very unlikely to be hurt by a dishwasher. There's nothing on them that can actually be damaged. The big problem with Pyrex, okay, is that they have these finishes on them, like there's these enameled patterns, okay? And it's the enamel on them that will actually just be destroyed, okay? Like, and you'll, and you'll definitely notice, like, the stuff just gets completely worn away by the abrasive, like, the abrasiveness of the, di the, vin the, the dishwasher cleaning detergents or whatever. <laughs> is there any real difference between wooden crochet hooks and metal hooks? If you were using wooden crochet hooks, um, you would probably want to be using fairly slippery yarn because if you're using uh, yarn that is not slippery or very hairy or catches a lot then using a wooden hook is going to be super frustrating because it will catch on the hook. Um, you may notice that I use almost nothing but metal hooks but that is because I essentially go for slipperiness on the hook more than anything else because I'm usually working for speed and I'm just kind of like I've used metal hooks my whole life. I'm just like, that's what I'm used to as well. I do have one or two wooden hooks that I more or less never use. The other problem with wooden hooks is that the top of them tends not to be as well formed, as in they tend to have a rougher cut, especially if they're not very high quality ones. Um, I have not seen enough of very high quality wooden hooks to know the difference, but like to see if there is a significant difference in the actual cut. Like, you can see this, all right? And you can see that the hook is a very clear, smooth shape with a nice point on it. And this is, this is a boy hook. Most of my hooks are boy or something similar. Yeah. So there's that, you know, like, I like that. It's a nice shape. Wooden hooks tend to have just this, essentially they have like a single cut here and 
there's a lot less rounding on it and that definitely contributes to the amount of catch that you get. I have a flight coming up in October and I don't want to take my mental hook. So I've also been wondering about that. But apparently TSA has said that it's metal hooks are allowed. Like crochet hooks essentially are allowed. And if they take my fucking metal hooks, I'm going to be very pissed off. I have a, a flight coming up in December. And God help them if they take my hooks. I will kick up an absolute stink about it. Um, but ultimately it's not going to matter that much because like I'll just take my slightly shittier metal hooks and I won't care. And once I get to, like I'm flying to Ireland for essentially over for Christmas. And once I get to Ireland, I'll just, you know, walk into a thrift store, buy a bunch of metal hooks. They're very easy to replace. Yeah, I, I would say, like, if you're, if you're worried about that, like, just go with what you're most comfortable with and just be, you know, make sure that they're disposable, I guess. I wouldn't bother getting a hook specifically for that. Like, I've got, like, 60 or 70 hooks that I just, like, I just, like, have them. I, could, I buy them by the handful whenever I see them in thrift stores, you know. I don't worry too much about like having not having hooks it depends on who you get yeah that's true but like yeah just you gotta you gotta kind of roll with it you know just like what do they say hope for the best plan for the worst you know plan assuming that they will actually take your hooks but if they do just have a plan to get some more once you land you know and then just like when you when you like when you're leaving or returning or whatever just uh I guess same thing and oh yeah and have something else that you can actually do on the flight like other than crochet like yeah oh KK okay, okay, while I think about it um I have an absolute ton of yarn okay and a lot of it I'm not using because I'm making a ton of bags and I'm not using the the, the yarn that I've got for like none of the yarn that I've got is good for like knitting and it's good for like you know doing garment stuff I guess with um with crochet but I don't really do that I make bags I make almost exclusively make bags at this rate like I, l I love my bags more than anything else so I am effectively giving away a whole bunch of yarn um I'll sort something out with shipping I don't know how it's gonna like I gotta know where people are and I'll see how much it's gonna cost to actually ship it but if you want some free yarn send me a dm just saying send me a dm and tell, tell me what kind of yarn you kind of like okay and, and I'll look through the stash here, which is astronomical, and I'll send a bunch out to people, I guess. I, I, like, I don't want it. Like, I'm just going to, like, get it, get it into the hands of people who will make things with it, you know. Spread the love, as it were. I'm, I'm going to make it available to, like, you know, just people locally here as well. I can give a whole bunch and, like, there's always people looking for yarn, you know, always. But you got to, you got to support your people. Make sure that everybody's got enough yarn and tools to do the things. Obviously. I'm going to Austin, so I'm sure they'll have places for me to shop. Yeah, I mean, definitely. You should just, like, go, go to the thrift store. Tell me if you see any nice lass there or something. <laughs> or something. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered, like, because I see videos of, like, people going to, like, the Goodwills and shit in the United States. Which, by the way, I've never been to a Goodwill. Salvation Army, yes. Valley Village, yes. I've gone to a bunch of them. But I'm still a filthy immigrant here. And... Getting the, the visa shit sorted out so that I can actually go to the States is I can, what I can only describe as a pain in the bollocks. And I hate doing it. And I hate going through Border Patrol. I fucking hate it. I'm like, I'm still waiting for my citizenship stuff for Canada to be processed. And I'm like, there is no goddamn way that I'm going to the States until that shit's sorted. But as soon as it is, you can bet your buns that I'm going to be hopping in my car and driving that to Bellingham to the nearest Goodwill because I want to see what that shit's like. Just saying. And I'm not, I'm not sure if it's even going to be worth my while, but it's like, it'll be a fun road trip, if nothing else, you know? I'll just have to grab, like, some friends that also have, like, ye olde Canadian passport or something, I don't know. Yeah, DM me on Discord, I don't know. I'll give you yarn, it'll be fun. I'll give yarn to, like, peoples. And people who want to crochet, or, like, or, yeah. Canada, yes, I am in Canada. I am in the land of maple syrup and poutine. I am in Vancouver, BC. I am a short hop, skip and a jump from the border. From a, a land of too many guns and weird freedom units. Freedom units and freedom books. I keep holding in that. Sorry. <laughs> I just was like, what do I, what do I think of when I think of the United States? Guns and the fact that they use Fahrenheit. That's really it. I bet your disabled gentleman from the community centre could use some yarn. Oh yeah, definitely. Like, um, I'm going to... That's actually something. He's already been to Michael's and bought a bunch. 
because I sent, gave him some recommendations. I don't know that I actually have anything that he would use because he really needs kind of chunky ribbon yarn and all the ribbon yarn that I've got, I'm currently using to make bags. Like everything else that I have would be stuff that he probably would be either too fine, it's too fine or it's too loosely applied for him. Stuff that would be good for garments. He's not making garments, he's making bags as well. <laughs> yeah. I get, I'll love, I'll have a chat and see how he is. I brought along my stand the last time I was at, the, oh, bugger, I've cocked this up. Um, I brought along my stand last time I was at the, the community centre and I I let him have a go at uh, doing one-handed crochet essentially with two hands because again it's a, it's a different type of mobility or whatever like that it's a little bit easier for him and I think he was, he was pretty successful and I explained how it worked and I gave him the crocodile clips and let him try it out or whatever like that and he seemed to he seemed to 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 make a good go of it you know so I'll see how he's getting on now if he's if he's gotten how he's getting on with the project I guess like he's doing a lot of practice you know fair dues to him like he's definitely wants to like in spite of of mobility and mental you know and mental issues or whatever like that and in spite of his disability he is absolutely got the enthusiasm that i really like to see in any student you know it's just it's really nice to it's really nice to see that and like any support that i can give him be it will be good if you're ever visiting to disneyland we should totally go for a coffee or something i mean where's disneyland <laughs> I don't know where stuff is in the thing. I have the vaguest idea where individual states are. I know Texas is south and somewhere in the middle. That's kind of it. And I don't know where Tennessee is. I'm sorry. My knowledge of American geography is fucking abysmal. Yeah. I know where Seattle is. It's like south of here. And... I'm really sorry to say this, but like all Americans, Canadians sound basically the same to me. I can't tell your accent apart. Like, unless it's super fucking strong. Like, I can kind of make out that a New York accent sounds different. Sounds different. Like from, from, uh, like, like New York doesn't sound the same as like if someone with an, like with an accent from Vancouver. But could I just tell what a New York accent is off the top of my head? Nope. Yeah, and if I'm in Seattle and like, sorry guys, all you motherfuckers said the exact same to me, like, I have no idea. It's really funny. As someone, like, it's, I think the Canadians always find it really kind of funny that I cannot tell the difference between, like, I really cannot tell the difference between American and Canadian accents. And like, they once tried me on different Canadian accents, and then they, they made me listen to, um, to what uh, Newfie sound like and it was the most jarring experience ever because it sounded like someone from Dublin trying to do a Texas accent or at least that's what it sounded like to me anyway it was very strange <laughs> super super strange I was like I couldn't make any tale of it it's like some of it sounded super familiar and some of it was like what the, is they trying to imitate this accent from the south of the states or something like that and because I don't even really know what a Texas accent sounds like I'm just like I, I don't know like that area or something I yeah I'm happy for yeah I know I'm happy for too he's doing a great job all you need to so okay so Cali yeah California I know is down south and off to the, the left yeah I know that much all right where stuff is in California I'm a bit more fuzzy on I know San Diego is a bit more south than San Francisco yeah but I don't know where San Francisco and Los Angeles are in relation to each other because I've never been I've been to San Francisco, I've never been to Los Angeles. And I know that you can drive from San Diego, um, you can drive from San Diego to Las Vegas because I've done that. And then you can drive from Las Vegas to the Hoover Dam because I did that and that was Arizona. And so I know it's California, Nevada, Arizona, maybe, I think, how that goes. I'm not, yeah, something like that. And I only know that because I actually did that road trip. <laughs> Like, but what's, what's north of that or what's between California and Washington? I have no fucking idea. Like I can, all I know is like Seattle's kind of here. And if you go a bit more south, you get to Portland. And if you keep going south, eventually you'll hit California. <laughs> no idea what's in between. Like, and I don't know where all the states are. Like I barely know the, like what Canada's like provinces are. And I had to learn that shit for the citizenship test. I learned it and then immediately forgot it as soon as I did the thing. I'm like, yeah, sorry. Not, not, not great with the old, with the old geography. This is why I have Google Maps. Sorry. 
That's said, however, I'm kind of like, I, I think I would like to go and visit Texas at some point, even though I've been told that like the weather is like brutal and I would easily melt if Vancouver summers like make me want to fall over. And because I feel, I feel that they're so hot and, and god awful, then I should never ever go to some place like Texas, because if I do, I will melt and, you know, pass out or something just from heat stroke. It was like the heat would, would, would be brutal, but it would just, it would, you know, it would be bad for me an Irish person born, raised, and his entire genetics are geared towards dealing with the rain. Yeah, just saying. Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, excuse me. Don't ever go to Arizona. I'm, I've been once, just once, because I went to the Hoover Dam, okay? And I can actually tell you my entire experience of going to the Hoover Dam, okay? And this was in, oh God, what year is it? This was in, this was in 2008, okay? And in 2008, myself and, myself and ye husband decided to uh, basically elope. And in order to elope, we spent, we, we spent quite a big sum of money and we took a six week holiday in the States. And during our time there, we drove to Las Vegas and got married. And bear in mind that in Ireland, this is really not the done thing. Okay, we were expecting to have this. We were expected to have this enormous wedding with all of our family and blah blah blah. And and, and we quickly got to the realization that if we were expected to pay for said wedding, it would never happen because we were both poor. So we decided that rather than have a giant wedding, we were going to go to the states and bum around the place for six weeks. Anyway, long story short, drove from San Diego to Las Vegas, got married in Las Vegas, and while we were there driving the rental car, which by the way was a Chevy Corvette, a Chevy Corvette ZHZ in bright canary yellow with a black racing striper in the middle that I still dream of to this day. We decided that a nice day trip would be to drive from Las Vegas out to the Hoover Dam. Because I've been, t I was told, you know, the Hoover Dam is this big, you know, it's this amazing like spot, like this big scenic kind of like whatever, and this, this amazing feat of engineering done by the United States or whatever in like the early 20th century or whatever. And I was just like, eh, okay, let's do the tourist thing, why the fuck not? Anyway. So we get on the highway and we start driving out to the Hoover Dam, okay? Hoover Dam is Nevada, okay? In that case, I've never been to Arizona. I'm just being ridiculous. I thought it was in Arizona because that was in that direction. Just <laughs> look, look, just, just listen. Here's the story, okay? So we went out, we got on the highway, we went to the Hoover Dam, all right? And we were driving across the dam and it was fucking chock-a-block when there's a traffic jam okay because obviously there are fucking tourists everywhere and we got to the other side of the dam and I thought well okay let's you know this is kind of okay let's just let's just get out and walk around and kind of like you know take some photos and everything like that because it does look kind of scenic, you know sunny and everything like that you know and I opened the door of the car and felt like I had been hit in the face with an oven door because the heat was oppressive and I stepped out of the air-conditioned car into the heat of the desert and felt like I was going to immediately throw up everything I'd ever eaten because it was so fucking brutally hot. We managed to stay outside the car for about 10 minutes before both of us said, fuck everything about this, we're leaving. And we got back in the car and we sat in the car and blasted the air conditioning until we recovered enough to actually drive. Um, and to this day, my entire memory of the Hoover Dam consists of just that one moment of me getting out of the car and feeling the heat just jumping down my throat. And I was like, I'm never fucking doing that again. I have no memory of what the actual dam looks like. Just that one moment I got out and it just like, oh my God, it was like setting foot in a furnace. I was like, I had no idea how people exist in this heat. Nope. All of my nopes. Every Every fucking nope. No, not right. People were not meant to to live in that kind of to live in that kind of climate. I'm sorry. Fucking desert. Especially with no shade, by the way. That was the thing that was really brutal. And even around like Las Vegas, it was pretty fucking hot, I'll tell you what. But I mean at least they had air conditioning almost everywhere. You know? Oh no. I was just no fuck everything about that. I want to booger this up. Where am I? Ah, no. That's not where that is. Fix, 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 fix. Back up. <sighs> it's 
try this again. Because that's up there. It should be the join there. Okay. I think I'm going to have to come down just so I can make this work. Sorry, everybody. Quick detour here. The pattern is going to be what I'm going to describe as somewhat fucked up, but we're not going to get too going to get too much into it. It's going to be fine. You're not going to be able to tell once they actually really get going with it. Wait, 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 wait. No, hold on, hold on. No! No, where are we going? No! Shit! No, that's the end of the row. I'm being an idiot. All right, all right. Rewind. Rewind. Let's try this again. One, two, three. Right. I'm from desert similar to that, so I actually kind of like that feeling. We are very different people. The mother's family is also from Mexico for many generations, so my genes are kind of like the opposite of yours. I, you know, Wild Nomad is from Chile and has lived in Mexico, Ecuador, and a bunch of other places like that. And she sometimes describes the heat and everything like that there. And I was just like, I, okay, A, why did you decide to move to the UK? And was that a culture shock? And also, oh man, never doing that. Like, never. Christ. I'm like the middle. I, I mean, you know, like I can, like I, to be honest, I think I, I can handle the rain really easily. Throw me in sub-zero temperatures. Anything. Yeah, I know, right? There you go. Like, I, I think people just have a particular comfort zone that they're, they're, you know, that they just kind of get used to, I guess. And it's not even getting used to it. It's just like, if you've lived, if you've lived there, you're, you've lived in that climate your whole life. And more importantly, if your ancestors have lived in that climate their whole lives, that, you know, just by a process of elimination, you're probably going to be more comfy in that climate. And yeah, like I, last time I checked my genetics, I am as purebred Irish as you can get without being inbred. And even the jury's out in that one, I'll tell you what, because Ireland as a whole is fairly fucking inbred. But yeah. <laughs> Oh no, I'm not using that color. Bugger. Come on, you. Like that. Do the wrap. No, no, no. Not before. No, do the wrap before. In, grab, pull through, wrap back for the join, lock in. There we go. And we're good. I don't need to. No, I don't need to do that. I was supposed to be doing it because I'm not doing a fucking chain up. This is when I just start to lose them. It's like I'm, I start to let's just like I forget what row I'm on or what thing I'm supposed to be doing, and the pattern just escapes me. And then that's the end of it. Like, you see, the thing about sub zero temperatures, right, is that being in Vancouver, all right, I had never really seen snow before coming to Vancouver. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it was a bit of a bit of a culture shock. I'll definitely tell you what. Like, when we got here the first we were here the first winter, all right, and it actually started snowing, and it started really properly snowing. Okay, and it was the it was fucking, hilarious. it was absolutely hilarious because we were like, oh, okay, we, okay, I'm going to hold off, hold off a second because we've already, we've been raided. Oh, okay. Veebs Toki, hello. Um, thank you. For, thank you very much for the raid. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for the follow as well. Um, how's it going? I still don't have any emote or things or alerts and everything set up because I have no goddamn idea how to do that. I got to get but my more technically inclined husband to actually fix this shit for me. I'm really sorry. Hi, how's it going? Hope you had a good stream. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you were doing crochet as well. We are doing some very bizarre um, color work here and occasionally ranting about glass and the weather. Um, <laughs> you get them commissioned. I, yeah, it's just uh, like my husband is far more techie than I am. Okay, and he streams as well. And he has all of those alerts and everything set up. And I keep meaning to ask him, like, can you do the same for me, please? Just so that I can have them because I keep forgetting. Um, yeah, <laughs> good job, me. Anyway, welcome. Um, thanks very much for coming and hanging out. Thank you for bringing, bringing the, the peoples here. I hope you had a really good stream. And, uh, oh, and, and like my river, usually river does my thing with the, hold on, hold on. Wait, I can do the thing. I'm, I'm not so techie that I can't, hang on, slash, how do I, yeah, okay, hang on, S, O, Thebes, something, 
Yes, there we go. <laughs> I'm like, I can do that much. I can do the shout outs. Damn it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so working a pair of strawberry mitts. Oh, fun. Like, where you knit? I'm assuming it's like knitting or crochet. Um, and you if you say strawberry mitts, I'm just like, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much. Go follow. Go follow. Go do the, go, go do the thing. Go do the follow. Um, yeah, I just, there's, there's other kind of like, uh, there's the other alert where like you can get someone's like feed to pop like their 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 most recent clip or whatever like to actually pop up or something like that when you do that shout out and I don't know how to do that yeah I could do both prefer crocheting same I crochet a lot I crochet a stupid amount um, I do occasionally rant about at last because I am an antiques dealer when I'm not crocheting and I specialize in glassware so occasionally you'll get me on stream and I'll just start just just giving like a practically like a history lesson I'm like here's a piece of glass and I will show you tell you all about it and like why it's important and why it may be worth four thousand um, dollars and a few other things yeah um <laughs> yeah my my life is interesting apparently interesting enough to get on stream and talk about it you know bull or bullshit about it I should say anyway my name is Cypherlev I do a lot of crochet I also talk a lot of shit and I tend to swear far too much but my crochet stuff is kind of a bit strange. I'm usually making bags. What I'm doing right now is double strand of color work, combining two different styles of doing crochet because I am working with two strands at the same time and holding one strand in either hand. Another thing that I like to do is I teach crochet, but I also analyze crochet styles and I make a point of learning every possible style and method of doing crochet, which means that I can do pen grip, knife grip, I can crochet one-handed with either hand. I can crochet with my feet because why the hell not? And I did, went to the effort of learning how to crochet upside down and backwards. If you ask me really nicely, I will tell you how to, or demonstrate how to do basically any of those things. Um, except for the feet thing, because that requires some setup, I'm afraid. And also maybe the one-handed thing, because it also requires some setup, and I'm afraid my stand and crocodile clips are in the other room. Hey, River, how's it going? <laughs> yeah. Um, if you are in Vancouver, BC, I go to the Marple. I, I teach at the Marple Community House every Monday at one o'clock. Um, we have the kind of little knitting and crochet circle going there. And like if you show up, um, if I am at the Marple Neighborhood House, I'm a volunteer, so I don't charge. You can just show up and I will give, hand you some yarn and start teaching you crochet. Um, but if there's something in particular you want to know about, I will also tell you here, or I'll try to demonstrate it for you. Um, I don't know how I demonstrate what I'm doing right now because this is effectively, yeah. So what we are doing, okay, is a combination of two different styles. This, what you can see here is that this, like this is pen grip, uh, traditional style crochet done with pen grip. You can also use knife grip. This is pen grip specifically because we hold the, the hook like pen. Now, but I'm also combining what's called English throwing style or what I categorize as being English throwing style. There is no real kind of categorization of crochet styles. I generally just give names to stuff because I apparently am the only person who does every single one of them. So I just have to make up names for them. Anyway, English throwing style is effectively like knitting, except you hold the yarn on this side and you throw with your finger around the hook. Um, it is very useful for doing two strand of color work because it lets you do stuff like this. Essentially, you can choose which loop is which color on the fly and it allows you to do color work a good bit faster. And you don't need to kind of pick pick the yarn, um, if that makes sense. Like in this case, I'll try and demonstrate it for the camera. Like I'm doing fans here, but the top loop of each double crochet is a different color, essentially. So if I'm doing a slip stitch here, I throw pull through and now I have both of my yarns coming out from the active stitch in the back here but so I want to start a new fan of double crochet and what I want to do is I start the loop using the black and I'm doing the pen grip at this point but when I get to here in the final loop then I throw with the gray and the last loop becomes a different color and then I go back to here and then again last throw and then like this and I'm doing six all together to actually finish the fan and if you get the technique of it you can get quite quick at it now doing the this doing throwing style or learning how to do throwing style requires quite a bit of dexterity and quite a bit of like just 
thinking. Like I do it very naturally with my right hand. I don't do it naturally all with my left. I do simplified English throwing with my left. I don't really do the full on throwing style like I do here. It gets very, um, it just gets really tricky because there's so much kind of thinking involved and because you do have to be able to move the hook with your thumb. And that's like, that's a tension thing. It's just like experience, you know? Uh, yeah, it is what it is. Like, but yeah, if you can get this down, then you can do this kind of thing and you can do color work, like this kind of two strand color work really easy. <laughs> oh yeah, go on. Thank you very much for the raid, all right? Go on, have fun. Uh, take it easy. <laughs> um, have a good Sunday night wherever, like wherever you are in the world. Happy time zone, et cetera, et cetera. River, I lately have an obsession with crocheting jellyfish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> jellyfish with little tentacles. Or, or, or Portuguese Man of War or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, little jellyfish. Every time I see everyone says, oh, I'm crushing jellyfish. I'm like, are you doing the ones that are like, um, like you can turn inside out or something? <laughs> I just, I'm just curious. I hope you're doing okay. I haven't been in Discord much because I've been, look, the last two weeks have been like an absolute trip and then some, and I didn't stream last week because of family related nonsense. Just don't ask. It's been like, it's been a whole fucking thing. I'm not even, I don't even get into it now. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I've been off Discord as well, just dealing with a whole lot of stuff. And I'm like trying to do the 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 actual antique stealer thingy bobby. Yeah. <laughs> you made three today. Oh my god, well done. <laughs> I mean if you'd like if you if if I I always think it's like if you if you make like multiple things in a day and each one brings you joy, then you're clearly doing well. Like I don't really make many bags or whatever. Like I'm usually got one bag and it takes me like a day or so to make it kind of a thing. This one is kind of a special case because this bag is both breaking my heart and also taking longer than usual because it's color work and I can't really go as fast as I could. So yeah. Now I have seven. I got ideas for more too. I'm going to mash them with animal characteristics like the jelly bee. There's a jelly bee? Oh God. Amigurumi, I swear, are just are wild. Like... Oh my god. Oh, I was going to say to you as well, River, if you need yarn, I'm going to give away a whole bunch of my yarn because I'm not using it for anything. I literally have a whole bunch of this yarn that I swear is great for doing like knit stuff and like doing kind of draped fabrics and everything like that. And it's fucking useless for what I want to do, which is make bags. A lot of it is really thin, like fingering white stuff as well. And I'm just not going to use it. And I have to accept I'm not going to use it. This is not my jam. So like, I definitely want to give away some yarn and oh my god <laughs> hi hello dear husband quadrain is my is is my beloved better half hi thank you for the raid where's your emote where's it says quad quad raid there you go hi honey how was your stream did you did you do well there you go thanks thanks very much appreciated um i don't knit but i know someone else that does if you do something like tell me what you're what you're making and i'll see if i've got something for you because i just tried to use a whole bunch of blanket yarn and i realized that i hated it with the passion of a thousand fiery suns so i have a whole bunch of blanket yarn and it's like blue and it's kind of stripy blue pastel-y kind of whatever <laughs> i look way twice i are red i are red oh hi. my god <laughs> hi legends hi how's it going did you have fun? Yeah, I had a great fun. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> and it was a disaster at start. A total disaster. Really? I, I had no camera. I couldn't get to things to, to connect. You could No camera and you couldn't connect. Yeah. Did you actually have a stable connection? Oh, I had a totally stable connection. I just couldn't get... I, I was trying to connect two things through Airplay, which you can't do. And yeah. I was like, oh, wait, I can't do this. Say hi to stream there. Hi, stream. Yeah, just yell into the... the hi, stream. There you go. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, um, just what is the other half normally streaming? You're, you're mostly doing board games, aren't you? Well, mostly board games, but I was actually streaming a, a, a video game called uh, Marvel Snap. It's a new mobile game that just came out. Oh, okay. Uh, Marvel Snap is awesome. I did a full day's quests, so I did a day's worth of missions about half an hour. So well, anyways. well done, honey. Right. I'll leave you alone. Do you want to drink or anything? No, I'm good. Thank you. Right. Nice seeing you, chat, <laughs> as always. Um, I nearly finished this earlier. I got another camera. Thanks for joining me, Legends. Have a good night. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's see you in a bit. Uh, Tengu5, thank you very much for following. How's it going, lads? Um, hi. Um, I don't do board games. I do crochet and I talk a lot about... I talk a lot, I talk a lot of bollocks about vintage and antique glass. Um, at the moment, I am making a bag using a somewhat tricky double-strand colour work technique. Yes. 
I don't know if I'll explain it again. I'm not sure if anyone's interested in it. <laughs> because if you're into board games, you're probably not going to, like, understand crochet or anything. I don't know. I don't know. Like, if you want, I'll explain it again. I don't, I don't, I don't really mind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, husband. Yeah, you mostly make amigurumi. Like, River, do you actually want some, um, do you want blanket yarn? Like, can you make amigurumis out of blanket yarn? Because I have, like, a... It's just like a two things of it that I was going to just donate back to the thrift store because I cannot stand working with. If you want it, like just totally awesome to medium, like get in touch with me on Discord or right and just like let's figure out something about shipping or whatever. I don't know. I'll try and um, like if you're not out in bumfuck nowhere, then it's probably okay for me to just ship it. I don't know. I'll just be throwing it into a bag basically. I don't know. Whatever. DM me. Let's just. That's just like I'll I'll earmark that stuff for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're like um, like North America going through USPS. I get access to USPS rates using my drop shipper shipper. So it's like it's not bad. Like you know, I can just go ahead and if as long as it's like not as long as you're not like in the middle of nowhere, it's not going to cost me a whole lot to actually ship it. There you go. Uh, I've blanket made the ship of Pentagon. <laughs> my girlfriend made. I mean. Does, does your girlfriend crochet or knit? Because as it happens, I have an absolute shit ton of yarn that I need to give to people who hopefully crochet or knit. Um, I'm going to just give away a whole bunch, like, and probably on stream for the next couple of, like, <laughs> I'm almost smacked down the middle. Are you near a major city? I hope you are, because it's like, I, I, like, I've noticed that, like, when I'm shipping to the middle of nowhere, it costs me an absolute arm and a leg. Um, I have no idea where Colorado is. Is it north? I, don't, I just, meh, I don't know. I'll just, just DM me and we'll figure something out. Oh, I'm going wrong now. Oh, my leg. Yeah, there we go. So what I'm doing now, if, anyone, if anyone's curious, I'm doing a combination of two different styles, English throwing style and traditional style of the pen grip, in order to work two strands at the same time and produce this particular pattern. And essentially what it is, is that this is, before the pattern gets covered up, this is basically what it looks like. All the double crochets that I'm doing, the top final loop is done in the secondary colour. And it gives it this accent. And on the inside, that's what the pattern looks like. Can't decide which one I like. Um, I may swap it and just go with this. And just call this like the primary, and you know, just turn it inside out when I actually attach the handles. But I set it up originally for this to be like the major, like the front of the bag, if you know what I mean. I just don't think it's working kind of as nicely as I would like. So I may just turn it inside out, call this that, and then see how I do. <laughs> oh yeah, just the thing about the t-shirts, don't worry about it. I still need to put up my new designs. Ugh. Here we go. Of the two yarns that I have right now, the black is kind of working nicely. That is a Loops and Threads Impeccable. And this is some rank horse shit that is not on board and I may not be using it again. I'm like, if I use it again, I may just, I don't know, I may just give it away to someone or something because I don't like the, I don't like how it's working up. It's a bit too, it is a bit too argumentative. It's like, it's a little bit too argumentative and fuzzy and not entirely on board with what I am doing, you know? And I'm not sure that the gray really works with this. I mean, it pops obviously against the black, but I think it would be a nicer effect if I went with like some kind of, um, like if I put some kind of cotton with this. Like I have really nice, like multiple stranded red cotton, you know? In a popular city, I wish I lived out in the country. I'm from Kansas and used to raise little baby calves by hand. Oh my God, that's cool. Oh. I'm running out of bubbly, I'll have you know. Once again, if anyone cares. Oh, excuse me. Uh, today's flavour is grapefruit with a backup of lime. Um, bubbly still aren't sponsoring me. <laughs> Get me if you aren't quick. I have no experience of, like, calves. Adult cows, yes. I grew up in the middle and I grew up in the countryside in Ireland. I have experience with farm animals. But uh, calves, not so much. Generally, it was just like adult cows and you stayed away from them, motherfuckers, because they tended to get pissy with you if you stayed too long in their field. So you just kind of had to avoid them. Little head butter. <laughs> nice. I wonder if American cows are more like, you know, are more cranky than, um, than, than Irish cows. I don't know. Do you guys have different... 
different cat. Yeah, you know, maybe it's a different species of cat or a different breed of cat. I don't know. Little teeth. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, come on. Just, just, you see what I mean? This is like, the black is getting a bad influence for the gray and it just stops working for me or just gets tangled or some other shit. Like, I don't know why I thought this design might be a good idea. I think overall I should have just like picked something else or just like gone back to the the burnout maker home deck like if if I may if I may just get pissy for a minute right I've been really disappointed by the sheer lack of options when it comes to actually making things with crochet because I like to have like because I'm making bags very frequently I'm looking for stuff that's reasonably hard wearing that doesn't pill in a big way because this bag has got to hold up quite a bit of like it's it's got to hold up to a very much higher level of wear and tear than just a piece of clothing or whatever it's also got to have a certain stiffness to it it's got to be able to hold its shape like and a lot of like I, I make slouchy bags up to a point but I don't entirely like it I like my bags to have thickness and structure even a little bit is pretty good now if I just finish this particular I'll just finish this here real fast with the right fucking yarn god damn you if I do this all right this bag this is literally just made of acrylic all right this is nothing special this is just like your your basic acrylic or whatever and it is done tightly enough it's woven tightly enough that it will stand up on its own it's not even like it holds its shape it's not slouchy at all you know it's just like that that's like but that's like the pattern itself and the thickness or whatever of actually using this because like this is your standard acrylic yarn and I'm using a uh, 3.75 millimeter I wouldn't like they would probably recommend that you use a five with this so I'm going down in order to increase the tension and it gives it a lot of toughness and structure but the problem with this is that there is a lot of fuzziness to this this is not going to wear in the way in a way that I would like basically it'll probably pill much more than I think is acceptable like especially this stuff this is incredibly fuzzy crap compared to this all right but like if I actually want to go and look for good cord that could you know good flexible cord that could actually be used to make like nice bags that would hold structure like I don't have a whole lot of options like it seems like Burnett's only doing the stuff that, like it's only doing the, the only company doing decent stuff is like I don't even know where a lot of people even get the cord for doing their bags because it sure as fuck is not in Michaels okay <sighs> That is a whole last thing that I'm just like, it's been ranting, I've been on my mind and kind of ranting about it. And I'm just like, I need to have a decent source for materials in order to actually make bags. It's proving to be really fucking hard because everything is catered for knitting. And you, by and large, you do not really knit bags. You knit everything else. Knitting does not lend itself well for doing that kind of like structural, you know, like creating a bag shape, you know? Crochet, yes, it's, it's good for that kind of thing. Knitting, no. But like, the, there's no yarn really to do it because it's just not popular enough, I guess. It's just, yeah. That's your rant for the evening. I wish I had more appropriate yarn for making bags. Sorry. We had five babies at one time. My sister and I saved them from going to a feedlot and they got to be, they got to go be dairy cows. Um, is a feedlot the thing where they, um, they fatten them up and kill them? Presumably it is. I can't remember. Like, although I have lived um, cow adjacent for most of my life, um, the actual mechanics of doing anything with cows is largely unknown to me because all the cows in my area would have been dairy cows already. As far as I know, anyway. Like, didn't really get into the whole farming thing. Sorry. <laughs> like, surprisingly enough, um, despite the fact that I grew up in rural Ireland, by and large, we didn't really get into the actual the whole, the whole business of farming, you know? I only know a certain amount about it. Like, a very small amount, in, in fairness. Like, I have never really knew much about, like, actually doing anything with animals other than, like, how to, how to avoid them or otherwise not piss them off so they didn't come and trample you kind of thing. I mean, I know sheep are assholes because I grew up next to a field full of sheep and can't confirm. They are fucking assholes. All of them. To a to a man slash woman. Huge, huge dickheads. But like 
I never saw any kind of aggressive sheep that would come and actually knock you down if you got into their area kind of a thing. Because we were never really good. We were never really allowed anywhere near them kind of kind of stuff. Like, and the sheep were just kind of like, they're, they're very much domesticated. They're around people or whatever. This is another case of like, you know, sheep would be wary around people. They kind of aren't. They don't give much of a shit, you know? And they can be dickheads, but they're not going to be like aggressive, come and fight you dickheads. They're more kind of like standoffish, hating you from a very large distance dickheads. That, and I don't care what anyone says, sheep's eyes are creepy. Super fucking creepy. Come on, it's fucking speeding the air now. But I mean, like I grew, like I grew up, <laughs> I grew up down the road from a horse stud and a castle. <laughs> Yeah, I once got to watch a C-section on a cow. It was fascinating for teenage grade. I also hand milk a cow to bottle feed a calf that had issues. Yeah, Quaid grew up in the middle of Tipperary. Um, and his dad was a farm manager for one of the bigger industrial farms, if I remember right. Quaid, if, if you could correct me on that, I can't remember exactly what your dad did. Apart from that one time that he took us through the, one of the giant breeding facilities and... and Although the tour was interesting, I'm not sure if it was really appropriate for um, <laughs> for his for his son and his twenty something girlfriend. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. Ugh. Was there a survival C section or a terminal? Oh, yeah, good question. Like. <laughs> All right, I was supposed to put the electronic down for bed almost two hours ago, so I'm ahead to bed. Yeah, yeah, no, go on, River. Chat to you on Discord at some point, okay? Take it easy and have a have a good time zone. Hopefully see you during the week. And hopefully I'll get some yarn to you as well. Don't worry about it. It's getting up to that time as well for me. It's like another 10 minutes and then I'm just going to call it a day and just like... I'm going to probably go and just crash out or whatever. It's been, it's been a long enough week for this. Like... <sighs> I spent like all of yesterday walking around the place talking to people and telling, talking to them about glass and being a giant glass nerd at people. And I can't tell whether half of them thought I was insane or, or what was up with that. Look, it's very hard to tell sometimes. I'm just saying. Okay, where am I? Oh yeah, no. So now I'm doing the joint time. It's been years. It was a breach birth moment, baby surprise. There you go. Not bad. Quaid, when when exactly did your dad give us that tour of the big breeding the big breeding facility in Deve, in Deve, the one where he was splashing liquid nitrogen around the place, which is going to really sound ridiculous to everybody, and I realized, but like just trust me, it was kind of interesting at the time. It was just like, like <laughs> that tour still lives on in my memory as like the time that my future father in law. Sin took us in a bit of a walk through this enormous, this enormous like like you know industrial farming facility, and they had these giant tanks of um, bull semen uh, in liquid nitrogen. Okay, and again, future father-in-law was showing this essentially just like he opens the tank and goes, "Yeah, see all that? That's bull semen." And then he splashed the liquid nitrogen with his bare hand, and I was just like, "Okay, I'm." this is happening I guess and I was just like I, ooh. <laughs> I still remember that as being just fucking weird I mean again interesting really fucking weird and now they're actually going to talk now they actually say something about it and explain it like that's what he actually did and I'm like yeah it was in our 20s like <laughs> fucking almost 20 years ago because we're old yeah <laughs> but yeah it's like I remember it really clearly as being really strange and kind of interesting but mostly really strange <laughs> yeah I don't know that was a fun time yeah yeah he's been he's been retired a while now well out of it I'd like to say now have I managed to balls this up yet or not I have not no we're okay we're good we're good we are good so I'm trying to essentially do a join in the middle of a fan here they also had a manned mechanical cow for extracting the bull genetics. Oh man. <laughs> you know, 
you think that stuff is actually urban legend, you know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure some people do think it is urban legend. It's like, nah, it can't be that. No. No. No, it's not. I don't recall us actually seeing that when we actually had that, that tour, though. Or at least I don't remember off the top of our head. Off the top of my head, like, I'm trying to think, like, what? Did we actually get to see that? Or... I, I don't think so. I remember the giant... Um... Oh God, the giant ring or whatever where they just bring the where they had the bulls brought in or something like that. Like, oh, I don't know. A lot of stuff to do with um to do with like uh. <laughs> it didn't bother me because I'd heard that tour since I was a kid. I mean, yeah, obviously, it didn't really bother me. It was just like I was just kind of looking and going like, should I really be here and seeing this? I don't even know. That's like, it was just a very it was slightly odd. I just want to say. I got to. <laughs> I don't think you have ever told me that. You got to drive the mechanical cow. I. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and non binary folk of all ages, I am learning some things about my husband, apparently. <laughs> that, that apparently his life experience in his driving a mechanical cow used to acquire bull semen. I'm. Yeah, that's um, that's interesting. I I'm kind of curious. What's it powered by? Is it like driving a lawnmower or a car? I I'm sure that I'm sure it's a burning question. I'm like, and it is now ten fifty four a.m. What a thing to end the night on. Mechanical cows and bull semen. You will find absolutely everything on this feed. I will tell you what. You, you you can jump into my feed and you will very, very likely see crochet of some description. But you will also get to hear about antique class, impromptu and history lesson, lessons, me bitching about the weather in Nevada, Arizona, wherever the, fell, where the, wherever the fuck we were, I have no idea. And and how how industrial farms in Ireland extract um, bull semen from bulls. <laughs> ah, yeah. It's it's been it's been a fun night. It's been an interesting one. It's been one been one for the books. I gotta say, like I'm definitely going to be like exporting this particular stream to to YouTube. It was just a slow tractor lawn for my engine. Thank you, thank you very much for this. This is important information. I, I I truly believe that understanding like this this is um this is a, a important information to be to be archived for the ages. And I have absolutely buggered up this again. Like. Someday, digital archaeologists are going to watch this stream and I'm pretty sure that some of them are going to be utterly fucking horrified. And if they are, I just want to say, hello assholes, do we have rocket cars yet? And if not, why not? Get on that shit. We were promised them back in the 50s and I want to see some movement on it before the Earth turns into a radioactive wasteland. A la Fallout style. But if you can't manage that, because for whatever reason at all, I just want you to know that you could do worse than making a mechanical cow that you can drive using a lawnmower engine. I mean, if we can't have rocket cars, we might as well have mechanical cows. Very rough looking bulls need very little to get excited. Apparently it didn't even have a head. I mean, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge. You know, we don't kink shame here. That would, that wouldn't be fair to say. <laughs> all right i'm going to finish this row and then we're going to call it and i'm going to probably i'm not going to like i'm not going to read out at this point it's just, just it's getting i'm i'm tired i'm pretty sure all of you guys are tired um yeah i there's there's only so much of there's only so much of like our our you know weird anecdotes of irish rural life can can carry us for the evening before they just get before it just gets a bit too much if you know what i mean Come on. Here we go. So we're just gonna we're just gonna finish this and then call it a day. I've actually got a lot done on this now, and I'm wondering how much further I should, how many rows, how many more rows I should add before I just call it and then just essentially decide whether the front, the inside or the outside is going to be the actual front of it, and then just call it good and call the pattern. 
I don't know. I don't think this is the kind of thing where I'm going to actually write up a pattern for it, mostly because I think doing this kind of color work is going to be a right pain in the bollocks for anybody who doesn't do this, this style. It's like, like you'd have to try and pick from both yarns and I don't know if there's a good way to do that if you're not just swapping between stitches as opposed to swapping in like in a stitch. I don't, yeah, you know, I don't know. Easy enough to do with knitting, but I do exactly the same thing with knitting, so I must want to look it up. And if there is an easy method for doing this kind of like color work stuff, then I may write this up as a pattern. Like maybe people would be interested in doing it, I don't even really know. We shall have to see. But like this is just a weird, like this is pretty fucking weird. Like who's gonna do this other than me? Come on. Funnily enough, all right, I did actually, when I was doing this initially, I thought, okay, look, I'm going to have to, if I'm going to get a consistent pattern, I'm going to have to essentially switch hands and do the double strand of color work, this particular, like, method, using my left hand as the dominant, as in swapping it so left-handed instead of right-handed. And I realized very quickly that if I could, like, yes, it's possible to do that, but do I want to do that without tearing my hair out? Probably not. Like, the dexterity required to do this on the right hand doesn't translate very well to the left, in my case anyway. So this is a pattern that I really can only do with I'm doing full English throwing style with my right hand. I can't do the reverse of it, which is kind of irritating, something I'm probably going to work on, but is what it is. So I ended up ripping all of that back because I was not happy with the output and it took way too long to do anyway. And I called it I said, okay, we're like, we're not going to do corner to corner on this. I think we're going to have to work in the round. And that means that I'll try the shell stitch first. And then this was the outcome. This kind of like, uh, like this arrow kind of V shape or whatever. Then I'm still not happy with how it's come out, but I can't really change it at this point because like I've done most of the bag with it, but there's also no good way to kind of like stop the base of the stitch from or you have to stop the base of the stitch from becoming, like... You'd have to do the that colour with the base, and I don't think it works. I would have to probably do the reverse, I think. As in, do the first loop in a different colour as opposed to the, the last loop for all the double crochets. That could come out with a rather interesting... Com that could be a rather interesting colour combination. Like, I'm not entirely sure yet. I'd have to do some experiments and see what I can get out of it. But, yeah, I don't know. We we shall see. We shall see. All I know is that right now we've got at least something rather interesting because, like, this, this pattern is... I mean, if nothing else, it's kind of, you know, it's distinctive, I guess, and that it could actually show up a little bit more. You see, if I pull this back a little bit, then that kind of shows up a bit more. Once the bag actually stretches slightly, you know, like, I don't, I don't know how I could just, like, if, if there was a way to kind of get it to pop out so that, like, each of those edges kind of pops a little bit more. And you can see it didn't in this case because I, I literally just made a mistake. I should have placed three on either side of this, and I didn't. I placed all three, I placed all six on one side of it, which means I've gotten cockless up. Oh, good job, me. Other possibility is actually doing, um doing a back post on this, but I don't think I'd be able to fit a full six double crochets around a back post. I've tried it before when I was doing, um, when I was doing a shell stitch actually, but I don't think it really worked. Like, I, I mean, like it's, it's technically possible, but tension becomes, like the tension gets really tricky. And like, especially if you're trying to do something very complex, I, like, I don't think it's going to be that successful. I split the yarn there somewhere, did I? I didn't. All right. Let's just continue. I'm sure that we can get this done. We're, we're going to be good. We're going to be fine. And it is 11.02. Boy, I'm going to be tired. In fairness, like, I've already had, like, a nap today because, like, again, the asshole crows waking me up before 6 a.m. Because all they could do is just sit outside my window and caw stupid loudly. Like they were having a fucking argument about whose turn it was to go and like 
peck stuff in the rubbish or something. I have no idea. All I know is them shits decided to just sit there and call like their lives depended on it for a solid like half an hour before I finally got sick of it and went and closed the window. At which point the room just got really stuffy and hot because like that's the weather in Vancouver right now. It is super, super annoying. Come on. Okay, nearly there. Come on, last bunch. And I'm seriously cocking up this pattern at this point. Also don't care very much. I think as I go along with this pattern, <sighs> fucking crows, I know, right? Like I just, them, those, those fucking crows, they normally hang out in like the, in, in the court, like in the other side of our building away from the bedrooms. And it's just in this case, they decided, nope, it is the perfect time to just shout at the top of our lungs at 6 a.m. And about what, I have no idea. This is not normal behavior for them. And now I'm kind of worried because if they started doing this, if they start doing this shit on the regular, I may have to petition that they just like, we just try and get rid of them. And I don't know, I even know how we do that. Just, I don't know, start leaving more food at the other side of the co-op or like our place where we live or, or like outside the co-op, put it in the park. That or... We'll see if we can attract a couple of coyotes to eat them. I, you know, I, I'm just spitballing. I'm kidding though. I would never actually ask the coyotes to eat the crows. That would be ridiculous. I don't think coyotes eat crows. I spit the yarn. Come on, come on. Got places to. Well, I mean, mostly we don't really have. They don't really have places to go. But I do have sleep to get. <coughs> come on. All right, all right, oh, we're nearly done. Okay, we're nearly done. We're done, we're nearly there. We can get this. If I can possibly do this with the right bloody yarn. Just don't be mean, they can remember faces to seek revenge. I know, right? Crows are terrifying. Crows are so scary. And like, I know that they're friends with some of our neighbors and I don't entirely know, like, what does that mean? Or so the fact that they were shouting at six, a, like, before six a.m. just really makes me worried that, like, maybe somebody has pissed them off, which does not really bode well for the rest of us, you know. Um, has has somebody has somebody done something that to make the crows mad? And if so, what do we need to do to make them like us again so that they don't keep shouting like before six a.m. Right outside our, our our windows and stuff, like it's just yeah, just saying. How do you make friends with crows if they don't like you? I don't know how that works. Like I tried feeding them at one stage, and they were just like did not seem to be interested. And I think there's like there's another one of our neighbors that definitely does feed them. Oh, and reportedly one of our crows can say "good boy," and I I don't know if they're known for talking, but. Apparently the crows that hang around our our block, yeah, they they talk. And that's a sort of a terrifying prospect. Just 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 want to make that known. Like just a little bit worrying. We have we apparently have super intelligent city crows. Yeah. Oh come on. Just come on, last two stitches. Let's do this. Come on. Ah. As my hands get sweaty, it gets increasingly harder to work the yarn. And it just, especially, especially when I'm using this fucking acrylic shit. Okay. Let's do this. Last, not least. Right, done. There's the row. So that's where we are. I can just actually pull this out a bit. Let's see where it's thick down over there. Yeah. Like I see, it's got like a nice bit of, it's got a nice bit of structure. That crow can say good boy and meow like a cat. Oh dear God. It's the planet of the apes, but the crows, it totally is. I don't know how to deal with that. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Nice bag. And that's the shape of it in the base. It's like, obviously you can squish it flat and it'll stay, but you can actually open it up and let it stand up and it'll hold its structure quite nicely because it's got that here we go. Yeah, I may just I may just finish this and call it good because like working more of this pattern is I swear it's going to make me cry. 
So I'll make a decision about whether to do the inside or the outside. That's obviously the outside right now. Uh, or the inside. If I just turn it all the way in, see how that looks. I don't think there's going to be that much of a big difference on the outside, in fairness. It's like the same thing, you're going to have like the base. It's just not going to have the nice ridge or whatever that'll be on the inside. And here we go. Mm, I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know what you guys think. I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. It's nice. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna be fingering that out some other day. Until then, I'm gonna shove this stuff back inside. As long as I don't wrap the yarn around the camera. And figure that out tomorrow. Oh, okay. All right, there we go, we're done. All right, guys, um, thank you very much for hanging out. I do appreciate it. I am gonna call it here. Uh, I'm tired. Oh, I don't want to just raid and run, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna call it. Um, thank you very again. Thank you very much for hanging out. Sorry I wasn't here last week. Like I said, family drama shit that I had to deal with and was not in a good kind of situation to really kind of like my brain wasn't there at all, right? Like I totally just like I didn't even think about streaming on Sunday night for whatever reason. Anyway, and yes, fuck those. All right. Um, I will. I'll catch you guys later and uh, have a good time zone wherever you are. And yeah, talk soon.